Okay. Uh, well, thanks everyone for, for joining today. Um, this is Data Science DC, and we're here to talk about uh, fine tuning latent deer clay allocation for transfer learning. Uh, if that's not what you were expecting to see, you're still welcome to stay. Uh, we enjoy seeing you here. Messing with the uh, uh, chat. Okay, so um, for those of you that may not have uh, attended a Data Science DC meetup before, either in person or uh, uh, virtually, uh, Data Science DC is the flagship meetup of Data Community DC. Uh, Data Community DC is a 501c3 nonprofit uh, that uh, Jeff and I sit on the board of, actually, but uh, uh, rotating board memberships. Um, and we're an umbrella group for a bunch of different meetups. Uh, really, we are uh, an organization uh, dedicated to, to building a community of practice for data science in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, although obviously meetups are our are, are most active activity. Uh, you can see some of the logos. Some of these are a little out of date uh, for a bunch of our meetups. Um, remind me, Jeff, we need to update this, this slide at some point. Um, and then, of course, uh, you can tweet at us at uh, Data Community DC on Twitter. Uh, datacommunitydc.org is our website. Uh, and uh, none of this is possible without sponsors. So uh, in person today, uh, logo is not up there, but Red Hat has provided the space for us. Uh, I see that they have also provided snacks and sodas. So uh, huge thanks to you, Adam uh, and, and Red Hat for, for making this possible. Uh, we also have uh, financial sponsorship from Prefect and uh, ATA. You know, none, none of this stuff is free. Um, you know, there's uh, Red Hat has to pay a lease on this building and for this, those snacks. Uh, we pay for a Zoom license. We have things like stickers. In the before times when we were providing food for everyone, uh, uh, you know, that would be between five and eight hundred dollars a meetup. So we're uh, uh, greatly appreciative of for the folks that let us keep the lights on, lights on. Um, uh, these four people here are the organizers of Data Science DC. Uh, Jeff and I in the middle are uh, here today. Janet is on travel in um, Germany. Uh, and Chris also helps out uh, as well. Um, so you can email us, Janet, Jeff, Thomas, because they got my email wrong when I joined the organization like five years ago, uh, or Chris, all at datacommunitydc.org. Feel free to, to shoot us an email. Uh, uh, Janet, Jeff, and I also are on Twitter, uh, and those are our, our Twitter handles there if you want to follow us or tweet at us. Um, we do have a code of conduct here. So, um, you know, we basically, I, I have a, a rule against reading uh, slides to people when they can read them themselves, but I'll, I'll give you the high line here, which is um, we expect everyone to treat everyone else with dignity and respect at all of our meetups. If um, you see anything that uh, uh, you think is not okay or makes you feel uncomfortable, um, for those of you on Zoom, feel free to uh, send a direct message to, to either Jeff Martin or I. Martin is with uh, the Board of Data Community DC, though not a Data Science DC organizer. Uh, and for those of you that are in person, you know, feel free to, to pull one of us to the side and uh, uh, we'll make sure to handle the situation as best as we can. Um, we also have a, a, a diversity statement here. So, um, man, it's been two years since I got to say this. Uh, so look around the room for those of you that are in the room and uh, uh, see the diversity of genders, ethnicities, ages, et cetera, just about anything you can imagine of the people that are here. And our pledge as organizers to the community is that we want the people who are coming up to speak to you all to reflect the diversity of the community. Um, we pay, uh, this wasn't part of the answer I gave you before, but we pay heavy attention to that when we're uh, uh, pulling out the slate of, of uh, people here. Uh, and uh, we ask you as participants to, to hold us to account there. So uh, if you feel that we're, we're missing the mark and uh, leaning too heavily in one direction or another uh, 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 with, with, with zero ego about it, please uh, email us and we will respond positively because we, we deeply care about making sure this community 
uh, the speakers represent the, the community as a whole. Um, we want to have a meetup in July. We're trying to do an in-person thing that is outdoors uh, at like a distillery or a brewery. Uh, uh, stand by. Uh, that may or may not happen depending on uh, how we're able to, to set up partnerships, but uh, we we're hoping to make it more of a social event rather than a presentation, which is uh, uh, pretty new for us. Um, but I assume all of you know meetup.com slash data science DC because you wouldn't be here if you didn't, but uh, that's how you get here. Um, so uh, uh, we also have a meetup uh, or, or a YouTube channel. Uh, we'd suggest you check that out. Um, any of these things, since we've been going doing these on Zoom, it's very easy to record. So we've been recording and posting uh, all of our presentations there. We also have a Slack channel. Um, so you can join us on Slack and we can post this these in the chat uh, uh, here for you folks. Um, join us on Slack. Uh, we have a, a, a thread for DSDC members if you want to talk about data science DC stuff specifically. There's also a job board, a general community board, a meme board. Uh, we are trying to get uh, that virtual community uh, up and running. So give us a hand and uh, feel free to join and be active there. Um, and so now would be a time when uh, we would ask if there are any community announcements. Um, so what I'd ask is uh, anyone who is in the uh, uh, the Zoom channel, uh, send a chat out, and uh, if I see you come across, I'll, I'll announce it out loud. Um, and does anyone in the room have any announcements, and I can repeat it out loud for the Zoom folks? Anything? Meetups? Looking to hire? Looking to get hired? All right. Uh, uh, I will uh, not hold us up then. Uh, so with that, uh, you guys came to see fine tuning latent deer clay allocation for transfer learning. Uh, it turns out today's presenter is me. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background here before uh, uh, I dive into my slides. Uh, I'm also uh, uh, part of the executive committee for uh, a group in the American Statistical Association called the Text Analysis Interest Group. Uh, for any of you that are ASA members, uh, we're trying this year to become a, a full section in the ASA. I think um, uh, statistics uh, has very recently woken up to the power of language as data, and we're trying to organize statisticians with, uh, no joke, 300 years of knowledge in analyzing data <laughs> and get them behind a lot of these new exciting problems that are in this domain. So, um, one of the things that uh, the text analysis interest group has done for the last couple of years that we've existed is at the joint statistics meetings, uh, we have um, uh, a panel of judges that go judge uh, the presentations uh, uh, that are in text analysis at the joint statistics meetings. Uh, I was one of those presentations uh, last year, so I did not judge. Um, but it turns out that uh, I am one of the two awardees that, uh, that won that award. Um, and a couple months ago, we had uh, the first one. You can check her presentation out uh, on our YouTube channel. So uh, this event is done in collaboration with them, part of what we awarded the prize winners with that I was able to do because I'm an organizer of Data Science DC it was like, come present at our meetup. Um, lo and behold, uh, uh, here I am as well. So I'm going to stop sharing really quick and uh, switch my slides. That did not work. So I'm going to reshare and then do that. Now, uh, hey, Martin, can I just ask you to give me a, a an, an oral confirmation that these slides are, are being shared again yes so i see tidy lda and your name uh on the right awesome okay so um with that let me collapse this view all right uh so as i said my name is tommy jones and in addition to to organizing data science dc and and being the president of data community dc um uh, I also wear uh, a couple other hats. So um, 
right now I spend a lot of my days running back and forth between uh, the statistics, machine learning, and business communities. Uh, I work in an organization called InQtel. Um, we invest uh, uh, dollars on behalf of U.S. intelligence agencies into uh, startups, and InQtel does just about any technology you can imagine. Uh, given my background, I tend to focus a lot on our machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, investment activities. Uh, I'm also a PhD candidate at George Mason University's Department of Computational and Data Sciences. Um, I am hoping, fingers crossed, that my dissertation will be complete uh, by December of this year, and I will be a doctor. Is, you're green? Is that why I'm wearing green? Uh, no, but uh, it's a good observation, yeah. Maybe uh, uh, in the back of my mind, I was uh, uh, showing some school spirit here. Um, so uh, what I'm doing uh, as part of my dissertation, and this is part of this uh, uh, research here, um, is I'm, I'm studying latent deer clay allocation to help develop more statistically principled ways to analyze language. So again, trying as a statistician bridge out into uh, an area that has historically been the machine learning community, but to try and help bring some, some statistical rigor there. Um, because language is uh, an abundant and information rich data source, uh, I really dream of a, of a world where we can measure culture, ideas, communication with the same rigor that we use to measure the economy. So if you can imagine now we have uh, these consumer price indices and you can peak, pull that all apart about different sectors of the economy and how prices are moving uh, done in a fairly statistically rigorous way. Uh, I'd love to, to, to have a world where we could start prying into different parts of the economy and society and seeing what sort of the cultural zeitgeist or what business sentiment is and things like that and, and doing that and, and integrating it into academics and policy and business decisions um, the same way that we do with uh, uh, economics. But uh, to do that, I need two things. Uh, you knew I need science. Uh, and as I said, a lot of my dissertation is trying to develop some statistical theory and that's around LDA. Um, and then of course we need tools. Um, knowledge is just knowledge, but if you provide somebody a tool, I think can they go be implemented in the real world. And ideally those tools need to be easy to use, which is why I love the tidyverse in R. It's an incredibly user-friendly framework for analyzing data. Um, so latent deer clay allocation or, or LDA, so I don't have to keep saying that same mouthful, is a Bayesian model for, for analyzing text that was created in 2002. Um, but the current, that was 20 years ago, uh, for those that are counting, uh, the current generation of language models, which are mostly deep learning based, work so well, and LDA is so old, so why am I still studying it? <laughs> So there's a couple limitations to the current batch of uh, pre-trained language models that are that are deep learning models. Um, first, they're they're really task based, so they're very good at doing things like making chatbots, summarizing documents, tagging parts of speech, doing named entity recognition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they aren't aren't really fit for task for making inferences on populations from samples. Right. And that is a very core statistical concept when it comes to uh, analyzing data. Uh, second, as I said, uh, they're almost all deep neural networks. And so for all of the predictive power that they bring, they're still black boxes when it comes to interpretability. Um, and as I said, I, I want to see statistical analyses enter the statistical mainstream by focusing on what statisticians do best. Uh, not just building better chat bots and, and following after the computer scientists who are doing incredibly valuable work at stuff they're better at than statisticians, and we're better at other stuff, right? So I've taken to calling this view uh, corpus statistics to differentiate it from this task-based version of natural language processing. Uh, that comes from uh, a term from linguistics called corpus linguistics, which is the study of real world examples of language to try and draw patterns, whereas a lot of the, uh, I would say, 
dominant approaches to linguistics now are very rules-based. You start with the grammar and then build up as opposed to analyzing samples of language and then inferring. But that analyzing samples and inferring sounds a lot like statistics to me. So uh, I use the term corpus statistics uh, to follow from that. So with the goals of corpus statistics in mind uh, to answer the question, why LDA? Well, it has some really nice properties. Uh, it aids in interpretability and quantification of uncertainty because it embeds text into a probability space. So if you look at like the nuts and bolts of like the core of how we do statistics, I have a real world event. I somehow interpret that into a set of numbers to cod codify that event. Those numbers then get mapped into a probability space that allows me to perform hypothesis tests, quantify uncertainty, et cetera, et cetera. Well, real world event is language. We turn it into numbers by counting words. And then uh, LDA is one method we can use to map it into a probability space. The nice thing about this is that means we can also lean on established statistical best practices to help us guide how we would use LDA to get better fitting models or, or provide a more rigorous justification for the model specification we chose. Even though the current state of the art still 20 years later is like, well, it looks good to me. I think we can do better. Um, and so finally, we can also study LDA as a data generating process to help provide sanity checks for our models. And I have a, a bit of an example of that when I get into some of this stuff later on. Um, so I'm going to focus on the tools part first, and then I'll, I'll circle back to a bit of the science that's uh, uh, relevant to this transfer learning stuff. Uh, in recent years, R has come a long way in developing intuitive frameworks for working with data. Um, and that's largely the tidyverse, and you have examples of packages in the tidyverse that are here. Um, and for text data, you have tidy text and a handful of other packages that do this for textual data. Um, and in 2015, I released a package called TextMiner. Um, back then, the text analysis ecosystem in R was not so easy to work with. The tidyverse was called the Hadleyverse, and I think it was like just like two or three packages. Um, but since then, uh, I've fallen in love with the tidyverse and the growing ecosystem of tidy text mining tools that are highlighted here in red. So um, in that vein, uh, I want to introduce you guys to tidy LDA. Um, so this is basically the next evolution of, of what I did in text miner, but it's a package uh, for latent deer clay allocation that uses these tidy principles and should integrate into that framework relatively seamlessly. Uh, and as we'll see, uh, it has some unique capabilities for transfer learning built in that you can try today, even before I finished my dissertation and gotten the research published. Um, buyer beware, though, until uh, uh, it gets through my committee and peer review. Uh, just for a review, um, here's sort of an intuitive take on, on tidy LDA, uh, or, or on LDA, pardon me. Uh, it takes a collection of documents that are full of words and splits them into two groups. Uh, topics, which are collections of related words, and then these simplified documents, which are now collections of topics instead of collections of words. Uh, and these are represented by variables of interest, uh, beta and theta, respectively. Uh, and I know for the folks in the room, the, the camera view is blocking the theta, but just trust me, there's a, there's a Greek letter there. Um, here is a more technical take. I'm not going to get into it too much, but for, for those that are familiar with Bayesian statistics, you have some prior of the way you think the world works. You encode that in alpha, which you see all the way on the left, and eta, which you see all the way on the right. And they help inform what your posterior fit is for beta and theta, respectively. But it's not just these priors. You also have this process in the middle there uh, uh, that is represented by uh, your observed words uh, to help uh, fit this model. Okay, and so now we're going to figure out how well I can uh, uh, deal with screen share live, uh, and I'm going to try and do a live coding demo for you folks. Okay, so I stopped screen share. Put my our studio window. I want to go into my display settings, which are somewhere. 
Bueller. There we go. Do, 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 do. Mirror it. All right, in the room we see a mirrored display. Where did my Zoom window go? There we go. Share my screen again. Okay. All right. And so Martin, can you confirm that you can see an R screen? Yeah. You can see it? Great. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I can see it too. Sorry, just slow to unmute. No worries. All right. So here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to load a bunch of libraries. Um, I'll make this slightly less big so I can see a little bit more of my screen. Um, we're going to load a bunch of libraries, one of which is uh, this package called Gutenberg R, which uh, has books from Project Gutenberg. And I want to do an analysis with the War of the Worlds here. So, okay. So, up front here is a bunch of stuff I'm not going to spend a ton of time on. Uh, it's basically just data formatting. So, downloading the book. Um, Go. And so this creates this, this tibble that is uh, one row per line in the book. And you can see here on the bottom that, you know, instead of the cover, it just says cover. Uh, we got a bunch of blank lines. We got the title. We got the, the author. And what I want to do is um, I want to divide this book into documents that uh, uh, are collections by paragraph and chapter. That's going to let me say one document is a paragraph of this book, and we're going to do some modeling on it uh, and compare uh, uh, the first half and the last half, et cetera, et cetera. So don't worry too much about what I'm doing here, but uh, remove some blank lines. Uh, and now I have uh, my paragraph indicator and my chapter indic indicator here. And now with tidy text, uh, we want to create a tidy tibble. And this is important to the to the tidyverse here. So uh, the the tidy version of analyzing text data is one row per token per document. So I said a paragraph is one document, a token or a word. Uh, so I get one row for for each here. Um, I'm not doing much with this today, but I, I do want to tell you guys why I actually love this data type as a basic one. Even though I'm using LDA and we're just doing like bag of words, count the number of times each word appears in each document and build a model on it. Even if you're getting down into these really complicated, possibly even deep learning models to like build a chat bot, you need now sequences of words that appear in order. It turns out that if I take this data type, I can roll up my word counts in ways that can be represented as simple as the bag of words or in these much more complicated uh, uh, models that would be used for making chat bots or translation bots or document summarizers, et cetera, et cetera. Not doing that today, but uh, uh, love that as sort of a, a general baseline. Uh, and just as a, a, some nice summary statistics, count the number of words by chapter uh, and see which words appear the most often and which chapter they, they appeared in. Um, okay. So uh, to analyze any of this data, we need to make something called a document term matrix, which is one row per document, one column per token, and uh, the IJ entries of this matrix, so the number of times each token appears in each document, or each word, I should say, pardon me, trying not to use jargon and clearly failing. Uh, so this is just a little function that does that so I can do it repeatedly. Um, so here, making that, that document term matrix, and this last command here, dim that gives me the dimensions right so uh 388 rows uh by 3285 words i did this uh with by filtering out chapters that were uh less than chapter 14. so this model is only on the first half of the book uh, and just to prove that this is a matrix here uh i'm going to print out the 
say first five documents and first 10 columns maybe. And so here, so this is this weird sparse representation. I know it's kind of small here uh, at the bottom of the screen. Let me highlight it. Um, so they suppressed the column names so that it wouldn't overwhelm this, but first word appeared one time, second word appeared one time in this first document, and then a whole bunch of zeros. Then you get ones and twos, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, all fine and good. So now I wanna create a model. I'm gonna call it model one. To do that, you're gonna run the, the tidy LDA function. Uh, for data, you just hand it your document term matrix, so no real uh, formatting or special data type required. Uh, I don't remember why when I first set up uh, this example, I chose 27 topics, but there you are. We have 27 topics, you know, shot in the dark. Um, this model is by, uh, fit by a method called Gibbs sampling. Don't really, don't worry about what that is if you don't know, if you do, great. Um, but we're gonna do 200 iterations, uh, burn in of 150. So what, what you're doing then is you're taking an average over the last 50 iterations, and that's what's gonna be the posterior that pops out of this model. Um, and then uh, a talk for another day, uh, uh, I developed a, an R squared metric for multidimensional outcomes that applies really well to topic models. Uh, and so we'll calculate that too. So let me just run this model. And you can see at the bottom, there's this progress bar. Um, small corpus like this runs really quickly, but very comes in handy when you're running a, a model that takes hours or days to, to run. So I can print this model out to the console here. And let me show you what you get. Um, so you get some summary information when you when you just print it out. So latent directly allocation model of 27 topics, 388 documents, and 3,285 3, tokens, just like I said before. Uh, you get the call here. So if somebody hands you a tidy LDA model that's already been trained and you're like, well, what parameter settings did you choose? You can get them right there. Uh, and if you don't see those parameters set, then you just know that they use the default. Um, this R squared that I uh, uh, is whole other research, whole other talk, uh, interpreted as the uh, variability in the data that has been explained by the model. So we've explained probably just about 10% uh, of the variation in the data uh, by this model. Uh, you can get the five most prevalent topics. So uh, which ones are, if you were to sample a word at random, which, which topic were they most likely to come from? and the five most coherent topics. So there's a bunch of coherence measures out there, um, but by and large, uh, this is a, a, a metric that's designed to uh, mimic human interpretability. And so the one that I've used basically says, uh, do these words in this topic co-occur together more often than would be expected at uh, random, just based on their co-occurrence frequency across the whole corpus? Um, uh, to give you a sense of what those are. All right, let me get my screen back here. So uh, you can get one uh, summary by printing it out to the the uh, the screen here. But if I look at this summary object, not sure why I'm getting a warning, but whatever. Uh, it has this this nice tibble here where all of that information was pulled from. So calculated when you fit the model your topic index, how prevalent it is, which is basically the uh, probability that a word selected at random would have come from this topic um, under the model uh, multiplied by 100. Uh, so it's a nice percentage number rather than a, a, a true probability, the coherence, and then the top five terms uh, of each topic. When we get all the way, we got all 27 here. So if you're not getting what you want from printing it out to the screen with a nice little summary, you can get all of this stuff there. Uh, coherence is a metric that is designed to mimic human interpretability. So would a, somebody who looks at this topic say, ah, yes, these words belong together, uh, or does it look like it just randomly put words together? We can talk more about that afterwards, but um, okay. So I told you variables of interest here are beta and theta. Beta is the probability of a word given the topic. Um, 
there's these nice little tidiers that give you, uh, you know, represented in the tidy LDA model, it is a matrix of probabilities. Um, that's not very tidy friendly. Uh, so you can get this nice tidy tibble that is one row per topic per word and uh, the probability of that word given that topic. Uh, you can use that then to, uh, along with, word given the topic. Yep. Um, and you can make these, uh, use these other verbs, uh, other functions from the, uh, the tidy verse here uh, to arrange some data and then make these nice little plots like this which give me a moment. Let this run for a second. And there we go. Make that bigger. This will take a minute. There you go. So you can get a graphical representation for, for each one of our topics here. Uh, so if you're going to summarize them, do that. If you're not an R user, this is probably like, okay, who cares? But if you are and you're used to the tidyverse, uh, uh, these things play well. So each beta, is, uh, each beta is sampled for each individual word, or? Yeah, I, uh, I don't want to get too much into the mechanics of how LDA works here today. <laughs> Just know that uh, uh, it is a model that what comes out of it is the probability of each word given each topic and the probability of each topic given each document. Uh, and that is what theta is, the probability of each topic in each document. And so we can do uh, similar sorts of things here. So now I got this nice tidy, tidy tibble here from my theta, one row per document per topic. Um, and I can stick that into uh, ggplot, this tidy plotting uh, uh, library. Now I'm, I'm going to make a different plot. Instead of bar plots uh, like we did for the last one, I want to take advantage of the fact that this book has all these chapters that come in order and we modeled the first half of it. So I can create this little time series that shows me the prevalence of topic 10, which was a topic I chose arbitrarily uh, as a time series of the book. As you go along, where does topic 10 become more or less prevalent? So we can see somewhere around uh, just shy of paragraph 100, there's a lot of conversation about topic 10, and then uh, just a few spikes elsewhere, but mostly it's just sort of in a low ebb. Okay. Uh, and so I built a model on half the book, and now I have this model and now new data comes in. Somebody hands me the second half of the book. And they say, what are the topics in the second half of the book? You could fit a new model on the whole book, but now you've just thrown away your old model. Maybe I liked that model. So what can I do? Well, one thing you can do is you can just predict under the model, what are the topic distributions for this new set of documents or this new set of paragraphs? So I'm gonna make a document term matrix here. Uh, so 508 documents. So more paragraphs than we're in the first uh, uh, half of the book divided by chapters. 5,017 words. So uh, there are more words in the second half of the book than there were in the first half. And I'd be willing to bet that there are words in the sec that appear only in the first half and not in the second half uh, and vice versa. And so in uh, the world past, uh, that was like, for me, maybe six, seven years ago, uh, trying to do this prediction was an effing nightmare of, pardon my French, of trying to manage like your different vocabulary indices to try and get these stupid things to line up. Uh, tidy LDA is not the only package that does this, but you can just use a predict function, just like every single model in R. You don't have to worry about it. Just hand it your data, your new document term matrix, and it will deal with the vocabulary alignment yourself. Also using Gibbs sampling here, 
uh, same deal, 200 iterations averaging over the last 50 uh, to give you your posterior. Same little uh, uh, progress bar. And um, what this gives you is the same as a theta, uh, uh, but now it's a prediction and I can tidy it up as well. Uh, oops, didn't mean to do that. Same deal. One row per document per topic, probability of that topic in that document. But now these were new uh, documents unseen when I fit the model. And I can plot a, the same time series uh, of topic 10, but now over the second half of the book. So I see topic 10 makes an appearance here somewhere around uh, uh, paragraph 650 uh, with a few spikes, but otherwise uh, uh, low prevalence. Okay, so uh, I trained a model on one set of paragraphs. I did a prediction on a second set of paragraphs. Now maybe I wanna say how much has have topic distributions changed from the first half of the book to the second half of the book. Um, so I'm not gonna get into what this code does. I'm happy to share this code uh, uh, with everyone who's both online and in person here after the meetup. Um, but I'm just going to format some things to do that comparison and then uh, plot it here. Zoom in. Okay, so uh, model one is the model that was trained on the first half of the book, and that's an in-sample fit for the topic prevalence. Uh, model two is the out-of-sample fit from the prediction. Uh, that we see from the second half. And now, uh, one thing that comes out when I look at this, but not really knowing exactly what these topics are or having read the War of the Worlds book myself. Uh, uh, so I will just make the observation that there are a few cases uh, like those that my mouse is circling around here where there's like kind of a difference in the overall prevalence of the topics. Uh, from the first half of the book to the second half, there's not like a huge difference. That might be because every model is biased uh, based on the training data that it had going in. So it is likely to find distributions that are similar to what it found uh, when you fit the model. Uh, you know, obviously they won't be identical because you've got different data going through, but uh, maybe there's a way uh, to get a more fruitful comparison. So uh, I'm going to go back to my presentation here. Um, forgive me. So stop sharing, change my mirroring options again. All right. Reshare. And great. all right. So over the last few years, there's been this big paradigm shift in uh, natural language processing. Uh, so previously, uh, your researchers would build models end to end off of a single data set. I get data, I train model, you give me new data, the best thing I can do is predict, or I can throw the baby out with the bathwater and try and use all my data to train, train that model. But now researchers are starting from uh, these pre-trained language models. So if everyone's heard of transformers like BERT, um, Roberta is one from a company called Hugging Face. There's a whole bunch of them. Ernie, no, Ernie was an embedding. Anyways, but pre-training has been around for a while. Uh, I think GPT, three they might be up to now, which, you know, billions and billions of parameters. Um, these pre-trained models can be fit on hundreds of gigabytes of text data and they are massive. But what it allows you to do is that you don't need as much data. You can start from a pre-trained model and then just update the model parameters based on your data. So it's kind of Bayesian in the sense of like, the model has a previous view of the world and then I bring some of my data to it. It takes that previous view plus my data and it updates it and I now get a new view of the world. Um, 
I think I already said this, but uh, just in case I didn't, these pre-trained models, because it can be fit on hundreds of gigabytes of, of data, uh, and they are, they are absolutely massive. Um, and here is just a, for those that, that maybe don't know, it's a proxy for the popularity of these pre-trained models. So there's this company called Hugging Face. They're really big in open source land. Uh, they have a library called Transformers that is just a repository for as many pre-trained language models as you can imagine. Um, and uh, uh, according to GitHub stars, uh, this repository has been taking off like a rocket ship. Um, I can tell you now in, in startup land, uh, anyone, any company that I talk to that uh, is doing anything with natural language processing is all using pre-trained language models. But uh, until recently, we didn't have, there weren't uh, a lot of things like this for LDA. Uh, other people are doing it. I am not the only one. Uh, I am happy to say that so far as I know, I'm the only one who's made it accessible to anyone who wants to download my art package and uh, uh, do it. But I've implemented a model that uh, enables this sort of uh, pre-train then fine-tune paradigm, uh, but for latent Dirichlet allocation. Um, I'm going to come back to, to this formula in a little bit, um, but right now I'm not going to get too deep into the math. Uh, but the gist of it is you take the posterior of your base model and you weight it uh, against the data that you have from your new, uh, uh, your new data set. And those update to give you a new posterior. So you're fine tuning that, that previously trained model off of the data that you have. That allows you to have the same topic, so you can compare old model to new model, but it allows the word distributions to update, just kind of like how we do in, in language anyways. Get a bunch of people in, you'll walk in the room with an idea, we'll all have conversations, I will update my understanding of that idea, and then I'll walk out and talk about it differently. It's kind of an analogous thing here. Uh, so back to uh, watching the statistician mess around with screen sharing. Uh, I'm going to just go back into R here really quick. Sharing again, and we're in R again. Okay. So now instead of predicting on the second half of the book, I'm going to take that model that I trained on my first half of the book, and I'm going to fine tune it on the second half. And you do this with the refit function in tidy LDA. So you give it an object, which is your model. You give it new data, which is again, a document term matrix, and you don't have to worry about aligning vocabulary. Uh, I'll just say really quick that uh, one of the way what uh, uh, I'm doing under the hood here is that I'm not throwing away new words that the previous model hadn't seen. Instead, I'm folding them in to the model. So it allows you to introduce new vocabulary words. And so the model's vocabulary is expanding uh, as I go along. Um, same thing before Gibbs sampler, 200 iterations. Uh, average the posterior over the last 50 progress bar and printed out that summary out to the screen. Okay. So same thing, same 27 topics, but uh, you know, I've got 508 documents and 6,346 tokens. So uh, whereas predict just gave me just the theta, this now just gives me a whole new tidy LDA model. Uh, you can see the call here. So now again, if you get handed one, you say, ah, refit that tidy LDA. This is a fine tuned model. So there was some previous data that helped inform it and it drifted in there. Uh, R squared went down a little bit. Not sure what to make of that, but uh, R squared for topic models is just like R squared for regression. You note it, but don't hang your hat on it uh, in terms of an analysis. Uh, top five most prevalent. Uh, uh, Topics, top five most coherent topics, just like before. It's nothing more than the same tidy LDA model. You just fine tuned it. 
So now I can do um, uh, a comparison just like I did before of topic prevalence, but uh, this time I let the word distributions within the topics change and drift. So if I zoom in here, um, you may not know uh, much of a difference before, but take my word for it. There are a few cases like here where uh, uh, those distributions did shift quite a bit where uh, uh, it's not quite as equal. Uh, let's see if I can do that from here. I'll have to find my R window again. All right, so this is the old one. So one, one area I would say is that topic 27 became much more prevalent in uh, the second model than it was when just using the prediction. So. Does topic 27 mean the same thing? Like, is it the same topic? Like, were there new words? Like, you could have had words jump from topic 27 to topic 17 or whatever, right? Yeah, well, uh, so um, you, the, the, the question was, is topic 27 the same meaning, I guess, is what you're saying from the first model to the second. Um, what I would say is that this is this is sort of where human interpretability comes in and we get into this sort of like was my model well specified type question. Um, one thing that uh, so the short answer is it depends. Did I tell you I'm a statistician? It's my favorite answer for any question. Um, what I will say, I keyed in, you, you said maybe a word can jump from one topic to another. Uh, under an LDA model, every topic has positive probability mass for every word. So it's not that they jump, it's more like the probability of that word given the topic changes. Um, we, we can see which, which words, uh, which topics change the most linguistically, um, which I'm actually about to, to do here. Um, so let's see, where do I want to stop? All right, so a whole bunch of, of code that I don't want to get into the, the guts of here, but it's normal tidyverse data manipulation stuff. Okay, so zoom back into this. Maybe, you did I leave it up? Oh, I left it up, that's why. Um, it is displaying super weird. Let me, let me just, the pedantic part of me wants, all right, there we go. Now we get a full screen thing. All right. So uh, turns out topic 27 is the, uh, the topic that changed the most linguistically. So uh, I promise you that was not rehearsed. <laughs> so there's probably some, uh, uh, that probably tells us something when looking at the first plot, I was like, oh, that chain line changed a lot in prevalence. And now looking at this one, we say those word probabilities, which you asked, changed a lot. Um, so let's see if I can, uh, now it's gonna get really bad because I'm gonna code on the fly instead of uh, 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 using my pre-canned code. But let's see if we can look at uh, what those uh, uh, were in uh, the old model to the new one. Yes, sir. In the, the first time you did this, were you using two different sets of data or was it was there two mutually exclusive sets of data or was it these are mutually exclusive sets of data yes okay both cases both cases okay. yep okay all right give me a moment guys So did I do this right? Yes, I did. Okay, so um, again, these are just looking at the top five words here up top. Um, 
zoom in just a little bit. Um, so under the first model, uh, topic 27, that first line there, uh, two things. One, it had a very low coherence under the first set of data, 0 0.04. Basically what this means is that uh, the words that are appearing in that topic are not like super highly correlated with each other in a, a, a statistically dependent way. Um, yet under topic uh, or under the second model, which is the second row here, um, looks like maybe this is a topic of contractions. I don't know. But uh, the coherence has jumped up to 0.35. So this coherence metric that I'm using is bound between negative one and positive one. Um, you don't usually get too far into the negative numbers. They're usually around zero, which is basically saying these are these words are not correlated with each other in a statistically dependent way. But when they start getting higher, uh, they, they are correlated with each other in a statistically dependent way. Uh, 0.35 is, is fairly high in the, the coherence metric. Uh, and so we can also see that shift in prevalence too. Right. Um, so let me close this out. Uh, I'm going to go back to the presentation here. Um, yes, please. Yeah, so um, one thing that I have not talked about yet, but uh, we'll give you an example of not not example code in here is that um, the uh, that refit function has the ability to add new randomly initialized topics. So say I have reason to believe that my new data has three new topics that were not uh, 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 present in my old data. Um, the first 27 topics will be initialized based on uh, the posterior of my prefit model. And then I would get three new topics where they were initialized at random. And so then my second model will come out with 30 topics, uh, topics 28, 29, and 30 uh, would be the new, new randomly initialized ones. And um, uh, the first 27 would have been updated from uh, the previous model. And so the example that I'll show, I, I just have a screenshot of some graphics that I made uh, from my research will show that there is, there is some promise to doing that. You know, I have not thoroughly studied this stuff. Uh, what I'm trying to do is build enough tools and, and give enough science to where, you know, folks like yourselves or, or other researchers can really run with it. Um, and, uh, maybe we can we can all make new knowledge together. Okay. Okay. So um, now uh, I didn't talk too much about uh, uh, this this model for transfer learning. Um, I state this formally in the research paper, but there's, I start calling this TLDA because there is a formal statement of that model. There's a slight modification of the traditional statement of, of the LDA model to make this possible. Um, if I can toot my own horn, I like this. It's uh, for those that are very mathy like me, this actually creates a Markov process. And so you can actually start analyzing, you know, like how topics will converge or di diverge or things like that, the same way you would analyze any sort of stateless Markov process over time. But uh, you know how I talked about how, well, I have it on the next slide, but um, so maybe I should stop riffing and just go off my script uh, so I don't go out of order. So a key question here is whether or not uh, adding new data and uh, like updating your model will allow the model to, to converge to stabilized topics. Like, do I reach a point where uh, if I'm adding new data, I'm not really learning anything new about the topic space that I'm trying to model? Uh, and I'll say that uh, under two key assumptions, 
uh, TLDA, which is now this transfer learning LDA, should converge to stable topic estimates uh, as it's fine tuned on more data. If one, the data you're adding comes from the same distribution as what was used to train your base model. Um, and two, if this tuning parameter A uh, is greater to or equal than one. Now, I didn't mess with the tuning parameter when I gave you the code example. I just used the default, which is one. Um, but if both of those are true, then that model should eventually converge. Uh, and let's, let's revisit this formula just like a little bit closer here. Uh, so as I said, the posterior of your new model here in purple is a function of your new data plus the posterior of your base model and then how much weight you want to give that posterior. You'll notice that the weight here is two terms, A and then this omega K thing. Um, take my word for it. I did some algebra. It's in an appendix of the, this forthcoming paper that uh, means that instead of having to figure out K weights, which would be the omega K, uh, you're able to collapse them into this one thing, A. And it has a nice interpretability as well. When A is one, that means every word occurrence in uh, the base models data has the same weight as every word occurrence in your new data. So if I train on a million word occurrences in my base model, and then add a hundred new word occurrences in my new data, then that means like I will be adding, what would that be like 0.1% uh, uh, of, of extra information to this model to allow it to update. So when A is one, it has this nice sort of interpretability where it's just like, I'm just adding data over time as if I had it all together, I'm just, learning it in order through this Markov process rather than all at once. Uh, when A is greater than one, that means your base models tokens have a higher weight than your new data's tokens. So also think about this as like a learning rate, right? If I wanna say A is greater than one, what I'm really saying is like, I really want you to bias yourself towards the patterns in the base data and only update if like my new data has like a really strong pattern. Uh, but similarly, if A is less than one, what I'm saying is I want you to weight my new data more and have sort of a decay in my old data. But the reason the model will converge, uh, assuming, I think every, I saw nodding around the room, I'm, I'm not so sure with Zoom, uh, if the new data comes from the same distribution as the old data, um, duh, that's pretty obvious. But uh, if A is greater than or equal to one, what I'm essentially saying is that like, I'm getting more data along the way and reducing the variance of my estimates. But if A is less than one, you're gonna get just this sampling error of having different samples, even if they're pulled from the same distribution, which will give you more noise in your posterior estimates. So key question then is like, how does A affect this and under what conditions will my models converge or, or diverge? So I set up a simulation experiment. Um, 128 uh, data generating distributions as defined by LDA as a data generating model. Uh, of those, I sampled uh, 100 corpora. Uh, so that's 128 times uh, 100 uh, 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 different corpora that I sampled of 10,000 documents each. For each one of those corpus, uh, corpora, uh, trained a tidy LDA model on the first hundred documents, and then fine tuned adding a hundred documents uh, at a time and seeing how uh, uh, the topics changed over time and did, did these converge to a stable estimate. I did, the, I did that for A in a range from 0 0.2 to two with a step size of, of 0 0.2. Um, and so key questions again, does the model converge to something stable? And does it seem to converge towards the data generating distribution, right? So I could actually learn a model that is not in near, it's getting worse, but eventually stabilizes at somewhere really bad, right? So 
I don't just want you to stabilize. I would ideally like you to stabilize in the direction of the truth, right? Okay, so here is a key graphic uh, from my paper. So this is a, this is a box plot um, of uh, uh, p-values actually. And I'll explain how I got those in a moment. Um, but basically p-values that are close to one here indicate that uh, a model did not converge. Uh, and p-values close to zero indicate that a model did converge. And so across these, um, it would be 12,800 uh, uh, different corpora and chains of models that I constructed. Uh, what you see is if A is less than 0 0.8, you're pretty much not ever going to converge, even if you're adding data that was from the same distribution. Right, the, vari the variance in your data is just like all over the place. And so it's taking your model posterior all over the place. And if A is greater than 0 0.8, basically one or greater, then you're almost surely going to converge with, uh, I can get my mouse, uh, you can't see my mouse. Well, with a few exceptions that are up there on the top right. But when A is around 0 0.8, there's a lot of variability as to whether the models converged or not. I think something like two thirds of them did converge and one third didn't, uh, if I remember off the top of my head. So these p-values, um, you know what, actually, the way I got to it is very complicated. And I think if I tried to explain, explain it to you orally, I'd probably lose half the room, but... Uh, I set up some hypothesis tests to see if it would convert or not. Uh, and so we get that. So what, what falls out, I'm not really sure how to interpret this, but 0 0.8 does seem to fall out as some sort of critical value. There is something going on in that space. Um, all right, so I'm totally still writing this paper. So this table is ugly as hell and I'm sorry. Uh, but this is what you get when I threw this together at like uh, 11.30 last night. Um, so I'm just going to give you sort of the big punch lines here. I did a couple logistic regressions assessing whether a model converged or not. And uh, on the right-hand side of this was A, my, the value of my tuning parameter uh, in the TLDA transfer model, as well as uh, some key statistics in uh, parameters from the data generating process, right? So like the question would be, does the value of A drive whether a model converges or not? Or was it really just like how noisy my data generating distribution was? And basically what falls out of this is like the single biggest determinant is A uh, with uh, decreasing returns, right? But uh, even so, uh, a is really what's driving across all of those different data generating distributions that I created, what's driving whether or not these models converged. Um, and then I did a second regression, uh, a linear regression, uh, only on the models that converged um, and looked at sort of like a pairwise Hellinger distance from uh, a previous iteration to the next iteration. But basically what I wanted to say is like, look, are you getting closer to um, uh, the, the, um, yes. Are you getting closer to the truth? Uh, and what is driving how close to the truth you're getting? So by and large, all of them got closer to the truth. That's great. Um, but again, uh, comparing the, the parameters of the data generating distribution on the right-hand side with A, a was also a big determinant of uh, how quickly uh, things got to the truth. Basically, uh, I think the, the, the punchline, if I remember correctly, was that um, uh, uh, larger values of A initially have like a much faster downward slope and then they flatten out, whereas those more moderate values are still taking you in towards the truth. Um, uh, uh, but at a, at a slower rate. Uh, and I think, which I don't remember if this falls out of these regressions, but again, when you have sort of the more moderate values, like you're kind of getting closer, whereas when A is really big, you can you go down really quick, but then you flatline not as close to the truth as you would be if you had the, the more moderate, moderate setting. All right, so in real life, 
uh, and I borrowed this from, uh, pardon the handwritten font. When I presented at JSM, I like really slapped my slides together and just like drew them in paint with an Apple pen. Uh, um, so, and I just grabbed the slide from there. Uh, in real life, you're not gonna be fine tuning on data that is drawn from the same distribution as your original data, right? So this was just a sterilized example to give you a sense of like, how does this tuning parameter uh, affect things in this sterile clinical environment, right? Uh, what I did is I grabbed a corpus from the Small Business Innovation Research Program, uh, which is a government program that uh, uh, gives grants to small businesses to do uh, uh, science and technology research. Uh, they published this grant database online. Uh, it contains about 160,000 abstracts from grants awarded between 1983 and 2021. And we're, we're falling back on my, I didn't mention this, I have an economics background in undergrad, so I really like time series, even when others don't. So I wanted to do some time series stuff here. Um, you can see from these uh, uh, bar plots on the right, uh, number of grants by year or, or number of words by year, that there's a structural break somewhere around the year 2000 where suddenly like we get like a lot more data. I don't really know what's driving that. Um, and obviously, well, because it's not so obvious. Presented last year, which is also when I pulled the data, uh, 2021 was still ongoing, so I didn't have much data. Uh, at this point in 2022, I think they've published all of that, but I don't want to update my data set. Um, that allows me to create uh, these time series, right? So what I did was I trained a model in 1983 and I, uh, uh, did the, the transfer learning TLDA to 1984, and then again in 1985, 86, 87, and so on and so forth. For each year, I added two randomly initialized topics. So maybe, maybe there are new topics that are appearing. Okay. So um, what you can see here on the bottom is how uh, the prevalence of this topic uh, changes over time. And then on the top, is how um, the word distributions change over time. And so this is from a model where I used, uh, I believe 0 0.8. Uh, I looked at 0 0.8 and one, but I didn't look at the other values for A. But you can see the convergence in uh, word distributions here, right? Like over time data uh, just becomes higher, higher and higher probability before it starts stabilizing a bit. Um, which again, as a statistician that makes, the makes my cold black heart warm up just a little bit when I see uh, uh, data rising in prevalence anywhere. Um, but there's still this question, right, of like, how does A affect our results now that we're out in the real world? And so what I have here are four uh, key uh, evaluation statistics for a topic model here. So I've got this R squared, how much, what proportion of the variability in my data was explained by the model? Um, for different values of A, and this is now averaged across uh, all years. Um, how about the log likelihood of the, of the data given the model? So how likely would I have achieved this data if it had been drawn from the posterior of the model and how that changes? How uh, coherence, uh, what is the average coherence across all of my topics uh, in a model, uh, average across all years? And then Hellinger distance is looking at from uh, the year at time t, the distance in the, the topic from the year at time t minus one. So like looking at how language, the language is changing over time here. So a few patterns that jump out. Um, one, when I'm looking at R squared and log likelihood, um, there doesn't seem to be much change from 0 0.4 to 0 0.8. I didn't go 0 0.2 to, to 2. I narrowed the range a bit, but there's not a ton of change there. Uh, it really, they really only start dropping when you get to one or greater. Uh, another pattern is that uh, mean coherence, eight is emerging as a weird critical value again, not quite sure how to interpret that or why, but for whatever reason, uh, the topics that I'm getting on average are the most coherent uh, when A is 0 0.8, even in, on this one data set uh, in the real world. Um, and then that mean Hellinger distance is performing pretty much exactly the way theory would dictate. When A is small, I have high variability in my posterior in between runs. So uh, 
you know, the models were going to be less similar from period to period, even as I'm adding data. But when A is high, like 1.6, it's basically saying, I really want you to remember the pattern you already found. Uh, so it's not going to be changing very much. Like most of the weight will all just be in that prior uh, uh, as you're transferring. Um, so I told you I would have one little example um, uh, of where there's some promise uh, of adding these randomly generated topics. This is not a pretty graphic, uh, but it is an interesting one. So somewhere in uh, 2020, uh, one of my randomly initialized topics uh, in the SBIR uh, grants database uh, picked up uh, uh, a topic whose top words were COVID and 19. Um, so I, I'm wondering if any of you guys know what happened in 2020 that might have been driving that pattern. So, you know, did I go about it in like the best way to have uh, uh, picked up a new informative topic? I got lucky, right? I just arbitrarily chose to start with 100 topics and add two every year. But even doing it that way, uh, you know, I have a handful of examples like this that show, hey, maybe there's there's some promise here. Um, best practices still TBD on uh, uh, how to do this in a repeatable way. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so here is my. Uh, 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 buyer beware statement. Uh, Tidy LDA is still under active development. Um, right now, I think the able, uh, API is pretty stable, um, at least uh, through the end of this year. Uh, and uh, I'll probably have some other stuff going on early next year. So like, first of all, I'm not messing with this till my dissertation is written. <laughs> I've got results. Let's stick with them. So you're good through the end of the year. Um, but when I do get there, I don't think I'm going to change the API for these core tasks too much. But one thing I'm really interested in is you can use that same mechanism uh, in TLDA to learn from a pre-trained model to have an expert seed information into an initial model. Like, I'm an expert. I think these words should belong together um, and be able to figure out how to have a user seed those in uh, a, a way that's pretty easy to use. Uh, right now, you can do it by like hand jamming numbers into a matrix and then cross your fingers and hope it doesn't all fall apart. Uh, I'd like to find an easier way to do that. Uh, there's a lot of common tasks that people will do when analyzing topic models. I have to confess that since I've moved into an investment role at work, uh, I only ever get to play with this stuff as part of my own research. So I'm not as in touch with like what users need to do to go do like an end-to-end -end analysis using LDA in the real world. So people want to open up issues on my GitHub repo. Uh, I'm all ears to try and figure out how can we uh, make that easier to do in, in tidy LDA. Uh, and then I told you tidy LDA is really the, the successor to where I started with TextMiner. Uh, TextMiner has been around since 2015. I have users all over the world I and mean, it's not the most popular uh, uh, R package, but you know, every couple months I'll get uh, emails from researchers literally all over the globe. It's pretty cool uh, being like, hey, I think your, your thing's broken or can you help me do this? So they'd probably not appreciate if I just stopped supporting it. Uh, since best practices are now getting pulled into tidy LDA, I want to have TextMiner wrap that so they're still getting those updates. Um, that's all I've got. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. This is how to get in contact me. Uh, you can email me on my personal account, email me at work, uh, tweet at me, or uh, open up an issue on uh, any of the GitHub repos that I have. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing really quick to look at the chat to see if there were any questions there, and then I'll also take uh, your questions in the room. All right. chat window. Um, and yes, Carter, there is a question about whether this will be posted on YouTube. Yes, it will. Um, so any, any questions in the room here? Okay, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, uh, 
do have to wait over there. How do you update your weight? It's like the same thing that we do in normally in the deep learning model. But that far away. Uh, no, it's it's uh, so the question was um, how how are we updating the weights uh, and is it like in a deep learning model or we're we using back propagation? Um, let me let me ask a question back to you because the there's vocabulary here uh, in deep learning the weights that what they call weights are kind of more like what the probabilities are in uh, an LDA model. And what I've been calling the weight uh, is more analogous to a learning rate in uh, deep learning. So when you say weight, do you mean my weight? That's like the learning rate, or do you mean the deep learning weight, which would be like the probabilities? Well, I, have alpha. I, have, I have alpha was a learning rate. So you have k marks of a w. Yep. So the w is actually the weight. I mean, you have to put a base model of the weight. Right, yeah. The, the, uh, don't worry too much about that W, because uh, that W just it collapses out in algebra. It's just more that that is if you unpack the math, it, it ends up being there. Okay, so it's not a okay. Yeah, yeah. It, so the, you know, I think the, um, the short answer is that weight that's like a learning rate uh, can be whatever you set it uh, uh, when you go run that refit function. Uh, if you don't set it, it defaults to one. Uh, and so that's just every token has the same weight across all of the history that you'd want to, to include. Um, to your question about backpropagation, um, this is using uh, Gibbs sampling, which is a, a similar, but uh, uh, not the same sort of process, but like, like, uh, um, backprop it is it is an iterative process where there's each iteration there is an update to what it's learning and then um, you stop what the thing that I was doing where I was saying I'm, I'm averaging the posterior over the last 50 iterations uh, often what they'll do they could do this in deep learning but I think often what they do and often what's done in many other LDA implementations is that you just stop at whatever the parameter values were at your last iteration. Um, but, you know, from my earlier thing about uh, we can learn, lean on the best practices from statistic, Bayesian statistical analyses uh, here. In like a lot of more traditional Bayesian stats, what they found is taking one sample is not nearly as accurate as averaging across many samples. And so that's why we're averaging across those is uh, that and there is a, an L paper actually that does that with LDA from several years ago uh, that shows that that will tend to lead to, to better fitting models. Or, uh, do you mind if I get a couple others around the room and then we'll come back to you? What's up, Elliot? So, is it? I'm thinking of a real world example where if you're if you're going to look at like a, like a constantly updating corpus like news documents or social media posts or something. You're almost going to be guaranteed in case any anything new happens to have a distribution from your corpus not like not change. Yep. So would that like so, so that would have to be something you'd have to expect, right? And I think in that situation, would wouldn't it make sense to have a a value that's at least rather high to counteract that so you're not not partially distribution? Well, um so uh, the 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 question was um in in social media uh or, or, or other instances, might you expect um, uh, a lot of the distributions to change? And if you uh, don't want to get swept up in all of that variance, shouldn't you have a high A value? Um, and, you know, I think my, I'll give you my favorite answer. It, it depends. <laughs> you know, look, if, um, I, I think it's going to depend on your goal here, right? Like if, what you're saying is my model has an opinionated view of the world that for whatever reason for my application, I think is good. And I don't want uh, it to, uh, you know, get buffeted too much by the high variability of my data, unless it finds a pattern that is really, really uh, loud, right? Then yes, if that's what you want, then yes, a higher A value would, would do that for you. But if 
maybe you're trying to do topic discovery and say like, I want to figure out like what's new today versus yesterday, then maybe you'd want a lower A value so that you're not completely forgetting what the past was like, but that my new data can like really bring out big swings and I could do a comparison like we did of like, which topics change the most. Uh, and then you might get into like, well, what does that mean? Right? So I think it's gonna depend on your use case. Um, so a question uh, uh, on the chat, is the Bayesian approach not computationally heavy? Yes, the Bayesian approach is very computationally heavy. Um, one of the things that I would like to do, uh, so right now, uh, uh, tidy LDA, the, the actual core Gibbs sampling is written in C++ for speed, but it is Gibbs sampling. So it is an inherently sequential process, uh, which means I doesn't matter how many cores my computer has, I can only use one. Um, there are other uh, 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 MCMC algorithms for LDA that uh, are embarrassingly parallel. Uh, one that I think shows some promise is called a warp LDA, which is a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo where they, the way they divide the problem up becomes like an embarrassingly parallel sort of thing. And you can do a delayed update. Uh, so that lets you like use lots and lots and lots and lots of cores. Um, at some point uh, in the future, uh, I, or if I go off into uh, uh, an, another life, but I'm still monitoring this, uh, somebody who's working with me, uh, may implement uh, warp LDA or something like it uh, as the, the computational backend. And I'd hope that uh, that would significantly speed up, both speed up fitting for, for normal size corpus or corpora. And it would also, uh, which was the original intent of the warp LDA folks to uh, allow for like web scale size corpora where you can just throw in, uh, you know, data sets that are hundreds of gigabytes or more uh, that are the same size as these, uh, the stuff like BERT from, from the deep learning models. Um, so not there yet. Yep. Besides it, time it would take, how does kind of updating each year, how does that compare to say if you refit each year from scratch? Like would you get very different results or would you be getting like, the same results, it just takes like way too long. Um, that is a good question. So, so the question, uh, uh, correct me if I, I got it wrong, is if I was to uh, build one model on all the years versus uh, iteratively building a model year by year, how, how different would the results be? Um, so to, to some extent, um, it, it's going to one is if uh, your A is not equal to one, uh, you will definitely get different results because the tokens will be weighted differently as you go through time. If A is less than one, are you weighting the new tokens? Yes. If A is less than one, you're weighting the new tokens more than the old tokens. Uh, if A is equal to one, then all the tokens would have the same weight. So in terms of like posterior weight for each token, they'd be the same. Uh, I think there is an empirical question about whether learning sequentially in order versus dumping them all in at once will, will lay, lead to very similar models. Um, but that's, it's empirical. So I, there's no way I'd be able to answer it without looking at the data. But I, I can tell you that um, you do get something different along the way uh, by doing the sequential uh, fine tuning versus uh, one model. So when I'm looking at trying to construct a time series like I was doing, um, which is not the only application of this for the record, uh, which the book example was not so much. I love time series, <laughs> but that's not the only application. But when you are doing a time series, what you're saying at each data point is this is what the world looks like when I know the past and don't know the future. 
But if I fit a model on all the data and then wanted to retrospectively look at like, well, what did the world look like in 2019? You're getting an inaccurate view because what the model has for 2019 includes data from 2020 and 2021. Right. But with the transfer learning approach, it's never seen that data. So when I look at it in 2019, it's saying this, you know, I don't know what the future holds. So in that sense, like you're getting a better idea of how well um, uh, your model might perform what on, on unseen data or, or like in, in real life when we don't know the future, that data has not arrived yet. Um, Looks like Jeff's standing up. So does that probably mean it's time to go? All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, uh, spending an hour and a half with me today. Um, for those on the on the line, I hope you'll you'll join our Slack channel. And for those in the room, thanks for coming, and also join our Slack channel. And I'm going to stop recording and sign off here.